Hello everyone, it's Wednesday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. The most serious shortcoming in the first half of the year, that is how Pyongyang described its failed spy satellite launch attempt at the recently held plenary meeting of the ruling Workers' Party of Korea. Adding on to that, Pyongyang vowed to correctly put the satellite in the right place. When will that happen? What else was discussed during the meeting? And with two major dates for North Korea coming up soon, what should we expect? For an in-depth analysis, we invite Dr. Ko Myung-hyun, Senior Fellow at Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Hello again, Dr. Ko. Good to be here. And we also have Brian Myers, Professor at Dongseo University. Good to see you, Professor Myers. Same here. All right, first question to our Dr. Go. Uh, North Korea wrapped up a plenary meeting mm. on Sunday, but it was without a speech delivered by mm. uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, and uh, this is considered quite rare. What, what is the reason behind this? So apparently it's, uh, it's the first time on the record that uh, Kim Jong-un has given a speech in a, during a plenary meeting like this. And uh, I think it's likely because North Korea doesn't really have uh, much to show for, for mm. this meeting. I mean, this is an important meeting, and whenever there's an important meeting, there's an, uh, the necessity or, so say, or expectation, I would say, of demonstrating success mm. rather than failure uh, of the, what happened whenever uh, in between the last, pl last plenary meeting and uh, this meeting. And then uh, I think uh, what the uh, North Korean regime has been thinking of doing this time was to demonstrate or showcase uh, a successful launch mm. of the, the first space satellite that North Koreans have developed, uh, the Manligyang mm. space satellite, on top of a new uh, space vehicle, uh, the Chonlima uh, space vehicle. But then we know that there has been a major failure, and then, and I think, uh, and then they haven't been able to recover from it. Uh, mm. There was a high level of uh, expectation that uh, North Korea might try to make up for the first failure by launching uh, another space vehicle mm. right after. But then, uh, for probably for technical reasons, North Korea has been able to do so. And then, as you mentioned, uh, it's been, uh, I mean, uh, if I, I mean, it's been said that uh, it was uh, one of the biggest failures mm. of, of the regime so far, which was acknowledged officially. Mm. So it shows that how bad the situation is internally in the regime, in the leadership circle. And I think uh, this is part, partly due to the fact that Kim Jong-un personally cannot hide his mm. emotional state, mm. his disappointment, and mm. then possibly uh, the stress coming from the fact that uh, it's not just the internal issues that he's facing, it's mm. an economic issue, crisis going on. We know there are news of uh, uh, starvation taking place in uh, some parts of the country, but also diplomatically speaking, North Korea, disp despite the fact that it's making overtures to Moscow and Beijing, uh, there's no, no possibility, um, no possibility, but then there's no major chance of North Korea being able to establish some sort of a dialogue with Washington, mm. which always uh, wants to have. Mm. So I think uh, these are essentially the constraints that Kim Jong-un is facing, and I think uh, the fact that he failed with the uh, the much vaunted uh, spy satellite launch has uh, compounded his uh, worries and, and disappointments. Right, so there was nothing for Kim Jong-un to show off and that's the exactly. reason why he didn't give the speech. Right, now Professor Myers, what caught the eye the most from the meeting was how North Korea described its failed attempt to launch a military reconnaissance satellite as the most serious shortcoming in the first half of this year. What do such words hint at and when do you expect another launch to happen? Well, you know, it's not a remarkably candid admission for the regime to have made because the overall balance that was drawn at the meeting was positive. Uh, the failure to launch a satellite was indeed a very serious thing to go wrong, but the party tried to put a positive spin on the missile launch anyway. And to be fair to the North Koreans, failures do translate into progress because one learns from mistakes. Uh, also, I think we should keep in mind that in contrast to the Soviet Union, uh, which used to see itself as being on the cutting edge of science. North Korea is a radical nationalist state, uh, so it can admit to problems of a technological nature without calling uh, fundamental ideological principles uh, into question. You know, it's acceptable in North Korea to concede failures on all fronts so long as Kim Jong-un himself is exempted from blame. And this time, too, it was the relevant officials who came under criticism for having, in effect, uh, let the leader down. Now, as for the next launch, clearly the regime rushed things the last time and will not want to make that mistake again. But North Korea has always been a country in a hurry. Uh, in the industrial sector, you know, there are so-called speed battles. And speed is an even greater priority in the nuclear sphere because Kim Jong-un does not want a long break in this kind of activity, encouraging the Americans to sit back and play a waiting game. He wants the White House to see 
that North Korea is very quickly carrying the nuclear program to completion. So I would expect uh, another launch to take place really as soon as they feel it can be done with a higher prospect of success than last time. Right. We'll have to see when this happens. Uh, Dr. Go, the regime also discussed defense and diplomatic mm. strategies in response to what they call the changed security environment. Mm. Uh, how is reclusive regime seeing the situation on the Korean Peninsula? So there's a more cohesive uh, alliance uh, between Seoul and Washington, but also this is the addition of Japan now. Uh, the President News overture to Tokyo has paid off. Uh, there's a, a rapid rapprochement between Tokyo and Seoul. Mm -hmm. And then we, we see growing signs of a closer defense cooperation uh, between the, between not just between the United States and South Korea, but also uh, with Japan. So there's a mm -hmm. trilateral uh, uh, defense cooperation now. And then we have seen that with, through the, uh, the declaration that uh, they are going to, uh, the three district countries are going to have uh, closer information sharing, mm. uh, which is a prerequisite to build a real-time uh, missile defense system mm. uh, in this region. Mm. And as well as uh, we are seeing more visible deployment of uh, the American uh, strategic assets, mm. uh, most recently the, the arrival of the nuclear uh, nuclear guided missile submarine, the right. USS, uh, SSGN Michigan. Mm. So all these uh, signs probably read by the North Korean regime as, uh, as uh, uh, increasing pressure, mm. military pressure coming from Seoul, Washington, and Tokyo. And this mm. is not something that North Korea uh, wants to be in. And they essentially, show, it's not a happy place for them. Mm. So I think uh, they're trying, probably trying to find way around it. Mm. But then for now, at least, uh, at least on the surface, they're mm. declaring that, that they're going to match these actions mm by the North Korea's quote-unquote enemies uh, with action. So mm. it's likely that North Koreans are going to carry out uh, uh, military provocations mm. to show that they are not uh, under, they are essentially, they are not affected by this pressure. Mm. So I think uh, uh, this is definitely going to be the, the theme of the North Korean behavior for the, in the near term, at least. Right, so it is feeling this increasing pressure that is shown by the uh, trilateral cooperation between Washington, exactly. Seoul, and Tokyo. Right, uh, Professor Myers, uh, all, as part of this response, Pyongyang made clear that it will increase the production of nuclear weapons and sets it will strengthen ties with those countries against the U.S., namely Russia and China. How do you see the North's stance? Well, there's no real surprise there. Uh, whatever may be going on behind the scenes, between Washington and Pyongyang. And as Dr. Goh says, it doesn't seem like it's very much now. It's certainly not enough for Kim Jong-un's liking. So it's only natural for him to try to make the case against uh, economic sanctions any way he can. And in saying he's going to increase the production of nuclear weapons and strengthen ties with Russia and China, I believe his main goal is in driving home to the White House the futility of sanctions. He's saying, in effect, look, my two big neighbors to the north, China and Russia, they're going to supply me with food and energy so that all uh, American economic pressure is doing really is making me more intent on developing uh, nuclear weapons. I think uh, Kim Jong-un's hope is that the Americans will make him an offer good enough to justify his returning to the negotiating table. And who knows, that may well happen. Right. So such stance is just uh, really natural for Kim Jong-un to make. Mm. Uh, now, Dr. Go, meanwhile, Kim young tae a former top mm. North Korean official, has reportedly returned to the mm. political bureau uh, after a year-long absence. Mm. Who is this guy and what does this suggest? So the Kim young tae is, uh, is a general at the, the North Korean uh, people, uh, army. And then he's known to be as the mentor to Kim Jong-un, uh, who apparently taught him about the art of artillery and the long-range strike capabilities. Mm. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's said that uh, Kim Young-chul essentially uh, inspired Kim Jong-un to develop uh, essentially the missile uh, capability that North Korea is developing really? right now, yeah. even though some, uh, another general is in charge of missile development, uh, Lee byung mm. So, so But then on the other hand, uh, Kim Young-chul is not known as a, as an independent thinker or, mm -hmm. or, or like uh, or who has an, uh, his own agenda, policy agenda, or like has a grandiose vision for the country. Mm -hmm. In many ways, he's a very loyal soldier. Uh, and then if, and then that's probably something that Kim Jong-un likes and makes him trust Kim young chul mm -hmm. especially in times, uh, trying times like, the, like mm -hmm. this one. And clearly mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un is showing signs that he's under a lot of pressure and stress, uh, mm -hmm. the outside pressure and stress, probably, not internal ones. And then therefore, I think uh, he needs to rely on somebody he is 
familiar with and mm -hmm. you can trust on. So, so the uh, Kim Young Chun's return doesn't mean that North Korea is going to change its policy towards uh, either in the eco economy or towards the outside. It means that it's going to stick to the current policies until Kim Jong Un himself mm -hmm. uh, changes his mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, this question just popped in my mind. But uh, I previously said that he returned after a year-long absence, mm. right? What made him to be absent for a while? So Kim Jong-un's so personal uh, management policy is essentially a revolving door. Mm. Uh, he only has a limited number of people, uh, essentially uh, his pool of talent is pretty limited. He only has a limited number of people he relies on. Mm. So, but then he also is afraid that, uh, apparently he's afraid that if you put too much power on the, uh, on the, at the hand of one single person mm. or individual, mm. he might uh, or he or she might uh, you know, become a rival to him politically. Mm. So he wants to uh, show this person uh, his own or his or her place in mm. the system that the Kim Jong-un is the ultimate power arbiter as well as the, the leader of the country. Mm. So, uh, so I thought the reason why uh, he has this revolving door policy for his personal. So I think uh, he probably demoted Kim Young-chul, uh, Young displaced him from a position of power for a year or so to show that Kim Young-chul only owes to Kim Jong-un himself mm. for his power and influence. Mm, interesting, mm. right. Uh, now, Professor Myers, why don't we turn our focus to the fallen rocket as well. Uh, last Friday, the South Korean military finally retrieved a sunken part of the North Korea's crashed space rocket, which is presumed to be part of the rocket's second stage. How significant is the salvage operation? Well, it's, it's a, a propaganda coup and something, of course, that the North Koreans were not very happy about. But I guess the full significance is only going to become apparent uh, when the investigation or the inspection of the wreckage is finished. And that's going to take a while longer um, because the military is trying to salvage as much of the rest of the missile uh, as possible. And uh, as everybody knows, there's a lot of um, strong currents in the Yellow Sea. The visibility is exceptionally poor. And the Americans are going to have to uh, join in investigating the wreckage. I think one focus of the uh, investigation is going to be on identifying the country of origin of engine parts and any other components uh, so as to ascertain which, uh, if any, uh, foreign entities are helping Pyongyang uh, violate international sanctions by developing nuclear weapons. So I think it's going to draw back the veil a bit and uh, that's something the North Koreans really don't want, which is why they issued an SOS to China as soon as the satellite launch failed. Uh, they wanted China to get to that wreckage uh, before the South Koreans. And ironically enough, that SOS was intercepted by the South Koreans and made it easier for them, apparently, uh, to find the wreckage. So I'm sure the relevant officials got criticized for that as well at the plenary meeting. But yeah, this could turn out to be quite a significant uh, intel boon for the alliance, depending on how much more can be brought to the surface. Mm. Right, I see. Now, staying on the wreckage front, uh, Dr. Go, I'd like to ask you, uh, South Korea's military is still mm. searching for the other rocket parts, mm. as our Professor Myers uh, already told, uh, told us. Mm. Uh, and that includes the rocket's third stage mm -hmm. and what is believed to be the satellite mm -hmm. Uh If salvaged, what different data could we get? Oh, it's going to be, as Professor Myers said, a major inter intelligence bonanza. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's something that I look forward to. Uh, mm -hmm. So by after recovering, if it's possible, uh, recover the third stage and we uh, have access to the, the space satellite itself, the Malikyong satellite, then the, it's going to be a very complex piece of technology. It's going to be the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. Uh, state of technology that North Korea has put it into. And that shows that how much North Korea had access to uh, this kind of technology. So mm -hmm. there's a combination of, say, not just a space satellite technology, but it's also about optics mm -hmm. and communications too. I think it's something that the, the Alliance pretty much very much focused on. What kind of communication uh, technology they had to put into the satellite because they have to transmit mm -hmm. the whatever image that satellite takes from the space back to the base station on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it has to be increased so that you know uh, the outside uh, you know like actors cannot have access to the what kind of information uh, the satellite is collecting. Mm -hmm. So essentially, this is going to be a combination, a complex of uh, cutting edge technologies that North Koreans uh, repeatedly have. So uh, so essentially, uh, having you know getting our hands on the satellite is going to be a major, even a turning point in our understanding of uh, uh, North Korea's missile development, as well as uh, having access to uh, the the 
uh, components of the satellite which will allow us to have a glimpse on what kind of uh, sanctions, uh, eva uh, evasions, activities that North Koreans have engaged in mm. in order to uh, procure these components. Mm. So uh, in, by extension, I think we're going to be able to understand what's the web or network of suppliers uh, outside of North Korea mm. that has allowed North Korea to re uh, reach such a high level of uh, missile and space technology development in such a short uh, span of time. Mm. So that's the reason why we very much look forward to it. Right, we will, we will. Now, Dr. Go, meanwhile, North Korea fired two mm. short-range ballistic missiles uh, toward the East Sea last Thursday. What was the reason behind this? So, uh, also, uh, the North Korean regime has announced uh, during the plenary meeting that uh, their action going forward against uh, or vis -a -vis United States and South Korea will be action for action. Mm -hmm. So, the launch of the two ballistic, short-range ballistic missiles was in response to the major fire exercise that uh, South Korea and the United States have been engaged in. In, uh, in the last uh, couple of months. Mm. So essentially, this is an action for action gesture on the part of North Korea. But then on the, on the other hand, it shows that uh, the North Koreans are probably reaching, in a way, the limit of their own military capabilities because uh, given that the scale of the, the South Korea and the U.S. joint exercise has been pretty major, uh -huh. uh, I think uh, the two countries have put in, uh, put into, uh, actually uh, showcase some of the most cutting edge uh, 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 weapon systems, uh, but then North Korea could only master uh, two short range ballistic missiles, which are neither new or, or actual powerful. Mm. So I think uh, this shows that the North Koreans are getting essentially tired of mm. uh, being able to match uh, the alliance capabilities. Mm. It's interesting to hear that these missile launches were actually showing how the, they have the limit of military provocations right now. That's something that we can read uh, from their actions. Oh, mm. right, I see. Now, Professor Myers, uh, after North Korea's missile launches, the USS Michigan entered Busan City for the first time in almost six years. And this is reportedly part of Washington's implementation of its pledge to enhance the regular visibility of strategic assets on the peninsula. What significance does this have, and what more will we be able to see? Well, you know, in, in strictly military or security terms, I don't think it has much significance. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main points of a submarine is not to be regularly visible after all. And I'm sure there are much better places for the USS Michigan to be uh, in the event of a North Korean attack than uh, sitting in plain sight in Pusan Harbor. I think the visit's real significance is more of a uh, political and diplomatic nature. Uh, as you guys reported on Arirang at the time, President Yoon uh, agreed in the Washington Declaration last month that South Korea would continue relying on America's uh, nuclear capability mm -hmm. instead of pursuing its own nuclear program. So the submarine visit, I think, was intended primarily as a public diplomatic gesture to reassure the South Korean people of Americans, uh, of America's commitment really to defending this country by any means necessary. Now, I don't think we'll see too many more visits of this kind because I don't think the U.S. Navy uh, is going to be very happy about its nuclear assets being used in this uh, ostentatious way. And I am in Pusan right now, as you know, and I think when you're trying to be chosen for the expo, uh, as our beautiful city deserves to be, you don't necessarily want this kind of headline too often. Mm, that's right. That's right. Now, uh, Dr. Go. No, uh, before I let our experts go, I'd mm -hmm. like to ask you this last question. Uh, North Korea will be preparing for events for two major mm -hmm. dates, which are July 27th and mm -hmm. September 9th. What significance do these dates have, and what could we expect? So July 27th uh, marks the, the Armistice Day. Uh, this is the day that the Armistice was signed, after, which marked the end of the Korean War back in 1953. But then this is a celebrated as a victory day by in North Korea. So this is more, uh, for North Koreans claim that they have won the Korean War against South Korea and the United States. So mm. that's the reason why they uh, commemorate uh, this particular date. Uh, September 9th is, the, is a state foundation day in North Korea. So uh, these are, have been traditionally been uh, occasions for North Korea to uh, uh, showcase mm. their greatest and latest weapon systems in military parades. Mm -hmm. And then uh, parading their weapon system has been part of their provocation or a communication strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the outside world. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, inst so the, the typical provocation cycle consists of showcasing a new weapon system, then testing them, 
and then uh, therefore and then deploying them uh, and at the final stage. Mm. So uh, that's the reason why the cyber servers are very keen on, uh, on the, what kind of weapon system North Korea will uh, showcase in these mm. parades. And then given the, in the backdrop of the uh, spy, launch, uh, spy satellite launch failures, uh, I think North Korea has a motivation to take advantage of these opportunities to show uh, new weapon systems or mm -hmm. maybe at least to show that uh, the ICBMs, uh, which actually signals to the outside world that the North Koreans are very much uh, keen on uh, threatening the outside world mm -hmm. with their nuclear capabilities. So it's going to be a political and symbolic event uh, for the North Koreans the, to demonstrate that they are not uh, on, uh, feeling the, the impact of pressure from mm -hmm. the outside world mm -hmm. and also that uh, they are uh, steadfast in their line of a strategy of uh, matching outside action reaction. Right, and they're going to do that by showing the latest weapon system, exactly. right? Exactly. All right. Now, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Thank you, Dr. Go. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Myers, for your insights. Thank we you. really appreciate it. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.